Okay, welcome everyone again for the video now to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. We continue with section five. So that's the first challenge. The counting is off with the lectures. But I think um, the reason is that some of the topics are shorter than other topics, okay? And the idea is that the slide sets are in like sections which are belong together. That's in the fifth lecture, we already are at section six and we continue with the Gaussian distribution. However, before we do that, let's quickly see what we've seen so far, okay? So first of all, we talked about probability theory as an extension of propositional logic, okay? Um, so why is that the case? Maybe because I like logic a lot, so that's one reason, of course. But the other reason is that in artificial intelligence, for a very long time, people were using logic for many things. So for example, if you watch Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. I don't know whether I said that story already in the, some of the videos, but now I say it live again. So when you look at this uh, scene where Dave, yeah, the remaining astronaut, uh, switches off Hell 9000 yeah, after the computer kills the other board members, um, he's in this, in this computer thing and he's switching off all the modules. Yeah? And there's no probability module. There's a logic module and some language module and some blah, blah, blah modules. And the reason is that in the end of the beginning of the 70s and end of the 60s, um, artificial intelligence was very dominated by logical approaches. So people were saying we need to formalize common sense with mathematical logic, and then we need to solve automatic theory improving, and then an AI can reason like a human being. Okay, so that was the approach. Um, however, there was another branch of AI called the connectionist people, and the connectionists, they were more like, let's start with the brain, let's study a neuron, let's do something similar, let's build artificial neurons with circuits. And that was the connectionist um, branch of AI. And they were, I think, in the minority, or they were not so successful as the logic guys at that point. But things changed with the like, deep learning revolution like 10 years ago or something. Now everybody is doing more deep learning, which is the connectionist approach to AI even applying it to things where you would think you need to reason like with logic, right? So you could even ask, um, like uh, having a, a deep learning network that, that can answer questions or something, that can talk to you or does an automatic translation, which is very surprising, okay? However, so in a way for me, it looks very natural to see now probability theory as an extension of propositional logic. So it's making it more general, it's making it more robust. So we don't only have true and false, but we have something in between, okay? And that is super useful. Um, we looked at probability theory for discrete and continuous variables. That's just uh, an easier way to think about probability theory if you learn it in, uh, with measure theory, for example. You only need measure theory, and then there's a measure for discrete variables, and there's another measure for continuous variables. So there's a unified point of view. But the, our intuitive way, like throwing dice or measuring the, the, the heights of people or something, is more about discrete and continuous variables. So that's easier to understand usually, okay? Um, then we had graphical models as a representation for PDFs. And that is now something computationally, right? So up here we had the logicians and then we had like some mathematicians who like statistics and probabilities. And now graphical models, graphs, that's something from computer science. It's a data structure, okay? That you've seen in DAP one to three probably and did some graph coverings or some other advanced algorithms on graphs. And so using this graph idea and combining it with probability theory now leads to a nice representation for probability density functions. And I think the example was that probability density functions now, for example, applied to binary variables like propositional variables, the number of parameters that you can have can explode. Yeah? For 26, you had two to the 26 parameters, minus one. Okay, and so the graphs are now a clever way to put additional knowledge into the representation. So if things are independent of each other, then we don't have to have all case distinctions. Okay, like if I'm a robot now and I would go through the door, yeah, I could now first walk through the door and then I ask the question, is the door open or closed? So that's one variable and it's completely independent whether it's raining or not. It's also independent whether it's raining in California or not, okay? However, if I would express it as a joint distribution, I would have for my world description a variable for raining in Dortmund, for raining in California and whether the door is open. 
And that's a super big waste of resources if I write down this joint distribution. And here the graphical models are a super clever way to, to deal with that. Furthermore, as we've seen with the we glasses and no glasses example, um, having a graphical model, yeah, suddenly we can also make little diagrams for things where I collect data from people and I can see how the variables are dependent on each other. So we can also learn something from the graphical representation. And if you like the topic so much that you want to listen to more lectures of myself, there will be a causality lecture, which is also in this semester for master students. Um, that's basically where the graphical models are the basis for talking about causal things, right? Which, which is a very interesting topic. So, next repetition slide. So, what is now inference? First of all, inference is heavily overloaded. And I'm repeating myself, so I'm saying always the same things when I see this slide. But inference is a word that is used in logic and many other things. We want to infer something. So, we have some knowledge and we want to infer something from it. However, in different contexts, it can mean different things. For example, um, another word is reasoning. Yeah? It's also like a bit fluffy word for the same thing. So it's not really exactly defined what we mean by inference. Typically, inference means we conclude something from given knowledge. However, however, it depends, of course, on how the knowledge is represented, what it exactly means, what we mean by inference. For example, in logical reasoning, we typically define axioms. Okay, So for example, we would say, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is also equal to C, meaning that equality is transitive, uh, as transitivity property, okay? So these kind of axioms. And then we can use inference rules, yeah, to derive new facts. And here's another special to deductively derive new facts. So that's something that you could look up. So there's a difference between induction and deduction. And I would refer you to the Wikipedia page. And until you don't know exactly what deduction is, you just use it, okay? And you hope for the best. You will intuitively use it more or less correctly, okay? Um, however, the only thing we can say is whether something is true or false. So we cannot say something about in between. Like, if it's in one hour, whether it's really raining or whether it's only likely to rain, okay? That was the story with plausible reasoning that we started with in the second lecture. The other thing with logical reasoning is that it's monotonic. So monotonicity, monotonicity typically means if A is less than or equal to B, then F of A is less than or equal to F of B, right? Then is F a monotonic function. So what does it have to do with logic? It basically means if I have some knowledge and I can infer a statement and then I have more knowledge, I get something, a bigger set of axioms, yeah, then I can only infer more stuff and nothing gets wrong. So the typical example here from common sense reasoning is pensions are birds. And let's say before my theory was that all, all, all birds are able to fly, okay? And that's a good theory for kids, right? So when kids then go to the zoo, they are surprised that there are birds that cannot fly, right? And this surprise basically means they extended their theory. However, now they have to take back some of their theorems that they had before, okay? So in a way, it's monotonic. And if you can also write it down mathematically, what it means here, but um, I can do it, so it's fun. So let's do it. And I can use a nice board here. So let's say you have a theory, which is basically a set of formulas. Or maybe that's not a good letter. Let's use M. Then, like, there's a calculus in logic. I'm not sure. Did, do you learn about these things in theoretical computer science, like propositional <coughs> logic and first order inference, whatever. Doesn't matter very much. This just means there's a mechanism that can derive from this set of formulas another formula, okay? And if that is the case, if I extend my M with another formula, with a new fact, okay, I can still derive F. So F doesn't get wrong. Of course, it's a bit strange, right? So, so what, if I, what if I include not f into my theory, right? Surprisingly, still I can derive f. However, I can also derive inconsistency, yeah, so that the whole thing is inconsistent. Anyway, so that's the monotonicity. However, the monotonicity is something that um, is not so useful when you look back at this um, 
California raining problem where we had this, I think there was, or was it an earthquake problem? No, I think it was the, the, the lawn was wet of your neighbor and that increases the probability that your lawn is wet too, okay? So that is now derived from the fact that the neighbor's lawn is wet. Yeah, lawn is a rasen, okay? So the lawn is wet of your neighbor. So your lawn is more likely to be also wet. However, once you learn that your neighbor was running the sprinkler, okay, then suddenly the probability that your lawn is wet is going down. So you can also unlearn things, okay? And that's possible to do with probabilistic reasoning, okay? Now, how does probabilistic reasoning work? I try to write it down as mechanistically as possible. So we always first define a joint distribution. Yeah, this is the same as defining axioms. Yeah, so this is your world knowledge where you put everything together. And the joint distribution contains more information than if you would only define the marginal distributions, right? So if you only would define P of X, P of Y, and P of Z, you wouldn't know whether the different distributions are, uh, whether the different variables are dependent on each other or not. This is only represented when you define the joint distribution, okay? Next, you have also some known facts. For example, you know that one of the variables has a particular value. Let me again stress, a random variable gets a capital letter, a value gets a small letter, okay? Try to do this, so that's useful to, to distinguish. And a known fact can be used to condition on the joint distribution. So basically now, I, I condition the two variables that I don't know, x comma y, yeah, on this known fact. And now, okay, I can write it down, but how do I calculate it? It's defined to be the joint distribution where I plugged in the little z for the last variable here, divided by the probability of the p of z. Okay? And this defines me the conditional distribution. Now, given this fact, what is the new world knowledge that I have? Okay, so that was the old world knowledge. And I could, for example, sum out the z if I only want to have the distribution of x and y. However, if I observe something, I now have a new distribution of x and y. Okay? So this guy is um, defined by the joint distribution. What about that one? How do I get that one? Any suggestions? <coughs> is it also defined by the joint distribution? I said the joint distribution defines everything. So how do I get this? Any ideas? So you just apply the sum rule, okay? You just sum out the x and the y. You marginalize, so that's the other words, okay? So this thing back here is also defined, if I define the joint distribution, also the p of z is defined. So the quotient is also defined in this conditional distribution. So that is basically starting with the theory, the joint distribution, putting in the knowledge, which means like conditioning, and next, we integrate out all the non-interesting stuff. And the non-interesting stuff in this case, say it's y, and we just use the sum rule to get rid of it. And this is called marginalization using the sum rule. So conditioning is really using the product rule, yeah? where the product rule kind of is hidden in the definition of the conditional, so they are like the same thing. So you could either say I define the conditioning bar, or you could say I define like the product rule. And marginalization is the sum rule, so that's the other one. So this thing is kind of putting in the new knowledge, the observation, and this thing is getting rid of the stuff you are not interested in. And then p of x given z is the answer. So how is that the answer? It's a probability distribution about the possible outcomes of x. So this is like a Bayesian way of seeing things. Okay, we're starting with some prior knowledge, which is basically contained in here. So here's a p of x in here as well. And now this is our posterior knowledge when we observe one of these things. Okay? So far so good. So this is basically probabilistic reasoning. You start with the joint distribution, you condition on the facts, and then you sum out the stuff you're not interested in. Good. So at the end, we have the posterior probability. And of course, we could also do this all conditioned on some other stuff. So here now conditioned on some hypothesis or conditioned on other values, so basically meaning my starting point could be also this distribution here, and then I have new facts, and I add something to it, okay? So the, the joint distribution at the beginning doesn't have to be um, unconditional. However, if I, if I define this guy over here, I cannot determine P of H. There's no formula that 
takes the joint distribution of x, y, z given h and then gives me p of h from it. So I don't have it. It's not defined when I only define that one. Okay? However, sometimes you cannot define the full joint distribution but only parts of it, which is also okay. Yeah? Okay, so this is really like writing down axioms up here and mechanically deriving stuff. And here's also some calculus with the product and the sum rule. However, the facts are now slightly different. I have variables and I, I assign them values. Okay? However, if the z, for example, is a propositional variable, yeah, so a Boolean variable, then basically I can also put these axioms somehow into probabilities and reason and generalize it. Good, so far so good. Next thing was graphical models, and that was really about efficiently representing probability distributions and like putting in world knowledge, yeah, so we know what happens if it's raining, then all lawns get wet and not only one, okay? And um, if the sprinkler is only on Tracy's ground, then only Tracy's lawn gets wet if it's switched on, okay? So this is like including now world knowledge and the number of parameters was reduced something from 15 to 7, which doesn't sound dramatic, but if you have a bigger network with, let's say, 100 illnesses and 100 whatever symptoms, coughing or whatever, or a blue hat, um, then basically this whole thing explodes and you couldn't do anything if you wouldn't have these independencies between these variables. However, here's a little detail. They are called directed graphical models, okay? So if they are directed graphical models, they are probably also undirected graphical models. And that's yet another way to represent joint distributions. Yeah, what would be an example of an undirected graphical model? Let's say you take a picture of me with your cell phone, right? Then you generated a nice matrix with lots of numbers in there, so that's a picture. And of course, the pixel right here on my blue pullover is very correlated with this neighboring pixels, but not so much with the blackboard, okay? So basically, they are like close links to the neighbors, but not so much to the other ones. And that could be expressed by an undirected graphical model. So if they are directed graph somewhere, yeah, some, some computer scientists must have thought also about using undirected graphs to do something similar. And people have, and this is particularly useful, for example, for image processing or these kind of things. There you can use these kind of graphical models. However, another one could be also, this is Bob, and this is whatever, David and Alice and Kelly and some other names. And that's basically how they, whatever, know each other. So that's like the friend network. And one of them gets corona, and suddenly all of them have corona, okay? And so you don't know in which ordering these things got distributed. However, at the end, there's a joint distribution among these six people, whether they have corona or not. So for example, given that B and A have corona, what is the probability that F and E have corona? So it doesn't matter whether B got it first and A got it second. It just means if there is a correlation, so it can spread across the undirected graph. Okay? However, of course, we could say, but there is a directed graph, right? We just don't know it. Yes, that's right. The graph goes either one or the other way around, but we don't know it. But still, we can express it in a clever way. Here's another generalization of graphs. So when you think of graphs, um, even more general is a computer program. So how is now a computer program and a graph connected? So if you have a computer program, you can draw a computational graph, right? Or when you write down an expression like 5 plus 7 times 17, then you could have like a path tree and you can do a computation along the graph. And so in a way, this is like a computation along the graph. We start with the nodes and sample those that don't have any incoming edges, okay? And next, once a node has sampled all its incoming arrows, yeah, the nodes from there, then you could also be sampled. And so this is like a computer program that could be run, the sampling data from it. And this could be generalized to include also, why not a while loop? Why not if and else? So you could have more general programs. And this is also generating a probability distribution. Let's look at it, what it does. So it's starting with throwing a coin with parameter 0.4. Okay, so this is a Bernoulli variable, fine. And then it's iterating. So as long as the last sample was had, we sample again. Yeah, I think this is a 
negative binomial or it's a geometric distribution, so it has a name. It's the one where you stop once you see a head, okay? And then you count the number of heads that you got. I think it's a geometric, I forgot. You can look it up. I think geometric. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, and that could be represented like a computer program, right? Super cool. Now, let's say you have data, yeah, a big Excel sheet of data. Could you infer the computer program that generates the data? That's an exciting question. And I think it's far from solved, okay? So this probabilistic programming is a topic which is also already like burning for 10 years or something, but the focus is more on deep learning, so that's more like the, the bigger fire right now. But there are interesting questions also in this probabilistic programming area as well. Unfortunately, it's also not part of this lecture, but there are other things. Now, maybe when you start um, computer science and you have to do the painful mathematics lectures, but I heard they are not painful anymore because now they are super useful and you find out that you use them all in machine learning, but think of the, think of the things that you could extend the mathematics also with your computer science knowledge. So like using graphs, yeah, you can extend and extend possibly mathematics. Of course, in algebraic geometry or these kind of fields, they know a lot about graphs, right? They make these super complicated diagrams. They have that already covered. But sometimes also computer science gives new insights or new ideas to pure mathematics, which could be quite interesting as well. Anyway, so far so good. Um, so this is a, the, the, the Gaussian distribution stuff is not so long, okay? That's why I'm repeating now a lot of the older stuff. So we've seen base rules. That is something very essential. Um, there are different variables in here that typically play different roles. So if I write down base rule like this, then typically x is the unknown parameter and y is the known parameter, so the data. So the prior p of x is summarizing my belief about x before seeing any data, okay? And I read this off because I think this is the right formulation. So if I haven't seen any data, what do I believe about my parameters? That was like in the example with the glasses or no glasses. I said it's a uniform distribution. I don't know, right? Of course, if I would be honest, I would think, okay, here in computer science, there are all these super geeks sitting. They are sitting too much in front of a computer. They are all short-sighted, yeah? Or what is it called? Myopic in English, I think. So they spend too much time inside, okay? They don't play outside. That's why you all have glasses. And then I think in the lecture, not so many people had glasses, surprisingly. But maybe only because now you have contact lenses and you are so... Uh, you don't like glasses anymore. Anyway, so that is my prior belief. And then I get my data. And then I update my distribution. And that's what basically what we did with the glasses example last time in the notebook. So how does the data come into play? It's coming via the likelihood term. So that is that term over here. So basically, assuming that I know the true x, so what would be the distribution of the y, okay? So given that I know the true parameter of having glasses, let's say it's really 0 0.444443, yeah? So what would be now the expected outcome or what is the probability distribution for you now seeing a person with glasses or without, okay? And that is basically the likelihood. The weird thing are, the most confusing thing here are these words, but they are really just like vocabulary. The top right part is called the prior, that's the prior knowledge. And this thing is the likelihood telling us how likely is it to see the data, right? Actually, it's also a probability. The prior is also a probability, but they get special names, okay? However, since typically the y is fixed, yeah, so y is the observed data and the x is the unknown, yeah, we could also view p of y given x as a function of x, yeah? So the x is the thing that can vary and the y is fixed. That's our observed data. And if we view this p of y given x as a function of x, that's when we call it a likelihood, okay? And note that it's not normalized in terms of x. So if I sum out the x condition on x, it's not necessarily summing up to 1, only in the first input, okay? That's why it's called a likelihood. Um, then there's another vocabulary, the evidence. However, we will see during the lecture the evidence could be also a complicated thing, and there could be a heavy evidence, and then hyper-evidence, and then hyper-hyper-evidence, and so things can get very complicated. So 
these vocabulary is only useful when you have like a simple formula like this, but when you have many terms, these things fade into each other. What does it do? It basically normalizes the whole thing. So that basically the whole thing will be a probability distribution in X, yeah? which is the thing that we have on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side now, we have a new distribution for the X, given that we've seen some data. Okay, we start with P of X, having no data, I have a certain belief about X, and then having seen data, I have a different belief, which is expressed as P of X given Y. And this thing must be a probability distribution in X. Yeah? So if I sum out in X, the whole thing should be equal to 1. Luckily, the P of Y is exactly that what I need to do this. Okay? So if I sum out this guy for, with respect to X, the P of Y goes to the front. And the bag, I could use the product rule to get the joint distribution. I integrate out the X and I end up with P of Y. P of Y divided by P of Y is equal to 1. So it's just defined such that it's properly normalized. OK, here's again this confusing thing. P of Y given X, it is a probability with respect to Y given X. But if I see it, the Y is fixed and the X is variable, then it's not normalized. And that's why it gets a different name. That's just how statistics wants it. But at the end, these are all probabilities. OK? Good. So far, so good. Any questions? up until now. I know it's sometimes frustrating. The professor shows the simple stuff and asks 10 times whether there are any questions. Then comes the difficult stuff, and we rush through it, and you have no chance. So of course, stop me if I do this, right? And I try to ask also when the more difficult stuff comes. OK, let's start with the famous distribution. And you already know which, I'm, which one I'm talking about. I'm talking about Karl Friedrich Gauss. So this is, I think, a Kupferstich. That was on the 10 Mark Schein, yeah, the 10 Deutsche Mark Schein. And um, that was pretty nice, right? So when, when you have a 10 Mark Schein and it's your topic, you're a mathematician or something, you always like it and you get one. I think I still have one. But now saying that, I always say that I have one. I'm wondering, where is it? Maybe I should put it into a frame. The good thing about this thing was, so you could take it into the exam and it has a formula for the Gaussian distribution on it. That's awesome, isn't it? I mean, what money does have a formula on it? That's really very nice. Um, let's see, do I have an eraser here? Oh, yeah. Do I have water? Yes. So let's copy this formula, because that's the most important formula for today. And um, that would be one that you should also know by heart, right? So you should know it for the exam, at least the Gaussian distribution. But in the exam, as I said, it's a closed book. But yeah, you can always ask, of course. And then we will be nice if there's something that you don't know, like, like a simple formula or something. OK, so let me copy it to the board. How can I copy it? I should know it by heart, right? So let's see whether I can do it. <laughs> OK. So the most difficult part for me is always the sigma square root 2 pi. Something like this. And. Um, so it's a p of x. So it's a density function, right? So let's look at it. So where does the x appear? So this thing is some constant factor. It's just scaling a little bit. And then we have the e function, e to the minus something, OK? So the e function looks like that, right? So that is e to the power of x. And now we have e to the minus something, so we just uh, mirror it at the y-axis. OK, now, what is the argument here? So it's x minus mu in squared. So basically, it's like a squared distance to some constant. And then again, some rescaling. So let's simplify it. And let's just say we have an x 
squared like this. Okay, so that is x squared. And now if I combine it e to the minus x squared, um, then basically now, let's say, that those are all numbers that are larger than 0. So I only need to look at this part here. So at 0, I have some offset, and then it goes smaller. Okay, and that's basically how the whole thing looks like. Okay, then we know from, maybe from high school, that minus x, that's basically now, that this is the mu, okay? So this is the location where I have the bump. And then divided by sigma squared, so what is this doing? Okay, if, if sigma is, uh, let's say, 1,000, yeah, then the whole thing gets very small. That means I'm staying longer here, right close to the zero. So if the sigma is very large, yeah, I will get, have a very wide thing. However, at the end, I'm also dividing by it, so I'm scaling it down. So this is not completely right, but instead, it's getting a little bit flat. Okay, so that is now a larger sigma. So in a way, so this thing kind of, the sigma gives me the spread how far it is. Okay, so that's how the formula looks like. Now what about this 2 pi thing and square root? That's weird, right? Where does it come from? Okay, I tell you, it's coming from the fact that this thing should be a density, okay? And being a density, I want that this integral is equal to 1, okay? And there's a nice proof, plugging this expression in here, yeah? You can do some calculations. Or maybe instead you, you calculate first, try that one. Yeah? Try to calculate the integrate, in integral of e to the minus x squared. Okay? And then surprisingly, it turns out you get something with pi. Okay? And it will be exactly fitting to that one over here. Now, am I required for the exam that you are able to solve this integral? No, you don't have to. That's not really something we do in machine learning. But it's curious, so if you are curious, so now I'm a super duper computer science student, we had this already in school, I should be able to do it, then try it, yeah? Give it a try. And if you can't do it, then you do it the same way I do it. You just go to Stack Overflow and you ask or you find the solution. And there will be someone must have done this already, okay? Good, so this is the formula. So, this is our first definition, the univariate Gaussian distribution. So, what is univariate saying? So, univariate means the x is just a real number, okay? And since there's a univariate distribution, there will be also a multivariate distribution. When does it come? Ah, it's not coming immediately. So, let's first talk about the univariate distribution. Um, first of all, so how did I write it? Okay, I wrote the p of x as now this new letter n, this curly n. And this is basically my abbreviation for the Gaussian density. And since there are more free variables in here, there's the x, the mu, and the sigma, I put them in here as well, okay? So the n is a function of three numbers, basically. Next, we want to talk about properties of it. And for example, you can switch the x and the mu, or you can do other things. And so it will be useful to have like a properly defined function. Anyway, we are computer scientists, right? So um, when we want to implement the n, we will figure out, oh, okay, there are two more inputs. There's the mu and the sigma as well. So we need to include it. We don't want to have global variables here, okay? So these numbers are all scalars. So far, so good. And the mu plays a special role. The mu is the mean. You knew that already, right? So everyone knows that this is the mean. However, when you want to prove it, really, you would have to solve this integral here, right? The expectation was defined to integrate x against the this density function in here. So you need to calculate this integral. And it's not super trivial, right? Plugging in the x and e to the minus x squared. I don't know how exactly how are you doing this. So I had to look it up on Stack Overflow. Yeah? So it's not easy. So this can be proven. Again, this is a little bit beyond of what you should be able to do. This is just showing you. So th those are just numbers here. And you can prove that the mu is indeed the expectation. You can also prove that the sigma square is indeed the variance, right? 
But it's not automatically the case, right? This is just some function that you write down which has nice properties. It's also not automatically that it sums up to one, yeah? So that's just only if you choose the constants, right? So here's the link, by the way. So here in mass stack exchange, there you click on this one, and then you get the answer how how to derive it. It's fun. So it's some interesting thing with pi. I think if pi appears, it's always surprising somehow. Great. Why do we write sigma squared? That's kind of weird. The sigma also has a name. It's called standard deviation. Okay. And um, let's say on the so why do we call why do we always write sigma squared? We want to have positivity of the variance. Uh, the variance is like the spread, yeah? and what is negative spread? So that's kind of unclear. So the, the sigma is like a scaling factor, and scaling factors should be positive. And if we write sigma square, then it will be always positive. Okay? So it's just a trick. Yeah? And when you implement it, many things make sense once you implement them. Let's say you want to learn parameters, then maybe you do optimization over a sigma, but you use it always as a sigma squared everywhere. Okay, then you don't mind whether it's in the optimization negative or positive. Good. Now, interesting question. So what about the um, things that we put on the axis? So what about the units of these things? So is there some intuitive way to understand the unit on the y-axis of the PDF? So that's a weird question, but um, so let me tell you what I now exactly am asking. So I'm having the Gaussian distribution or the Gaussian PDF. So this is P of, oh, we can also write NX. OK. And so on this axis here, I'm having the X. And that's the unit of the X could be like centimeters, for example, right? So this is um, now a physics notation using these squared brackets. Those are not the Iverson brackets. But those are the, it's the unit notation. So what is the unit of that one? And that could be, for example, meters yeah, or centimeters. And now the question is, what unit do we have up here? So basically, yeah, what unit does this guy have? And again, this is not so standard. Yeah? I'm not sure whether you learn it in statistics classes. This is just um, asking a question which we might answer partially. Okay, And it gives us some intuition and better understanding of what a PDF is. So um, there is this uh, notation for units here in physics. And the first thing that we will see is that the mean has the same unit as the x. And the reason being because we subtract the mean from the x. So if they are compatible, if they want to be compatible, they must have the same units. Otherwise, we can't do that. Okay, And it turns out that the standard deviation or the variance is the squared distance to the mean. So squared distance meaning squared meters. Okay, So it's the unit of x squared. Now what unit does this guy have? If we apply the brackets here and do some calculations, first of all, we see at the top we have meters squared, for example, divided by meters squared. So there it cancels out, which is good because the e function typically prefers to be applied to something dimensionless, OK? And it doesn't have a dimension. So that's good. Then the front part here, there's a div 1 divided by sigma. So that's 1 divided by meters, OK? So we found out that the um, unit of this PDF is per meter, OK? Interesting, isn't it? So it could be also, let's say, this is just a Gedanken experiment. Okay, let's say we measure probability mass in kilogram. Okay, so imagine we are um, I taking a saw. Okay, and I'm chopping out this part of the blackboard. Yeah, and then I could then I have a certain probability mass. It should be one. Okay, and then I could cut out a part of this one, and I can weigh it, and that's the mass of the whole thing. OK, so if this is kilogram, yeah, then the PDF, what it's really measuring is kilogram per meter. OK, however, probabilities are not measured in kilogram. I mean, we could, right, by taking a saw and chopping it out of the board. But a better unit is um, something that's related to bits. And bits is about information. Why is that the case? So if we have a, a discrete variable, um, 
let's say, a, a throw of a coin, then if I have a fair coin and I throw it, catch it, and you don't know the result, then I will give you one bit of information when I tell you what the outcome is. Okay? So bits is a measure of amount of information. And so in a way, like a PDF has a density, uh, has something like not kilogram, but something like minus logarithm bits. But that's a more complicated question also for math exchange. Okay? So don't worry too much about it. This is more like the fun stuff, at least what I think is fun. Okay, I don't know whether you also like it. But this is like a curious question. I won't ask it in the exam. Okay? So this is like additional material. Okay? So if you think, no, I didn't get at all what he's talking about and I'm not interested, then that's fine. Okay? Now comes the stuff that is more relevant. Okay? So that was like the introduction thing here. Now we want to prove formulas. And let me show you a formula that we want to prove. We want to prove something like, let's say we start with the Gaussian distribution as our prior distribution. And let's say our likelihood is also Gaussian distribution. What will be our posterior? right? And the answer will be, then your posterior distribution will be also Gaussian distribution. And we even can explicitly write down the parameters in closed form. Okay? This requires a bit of work. Okay? Let's see what we need. We need this lemma. First of all, we can prove, I didn't prove it, but this n function is always greater or equal to 0. Even it's strictly greater than 0. Yeah? So it's never 0. That's because of the e function. And I multiply with a non-zero scalar. And then it integrates to 1. That's another property. I mean, all PDFs should have these two properties. Now comes the more curious thing. Curiously, you can swap the worlds of x and mu. Yeah? That's kind of strange. But if you just look at it as a function with three inputs, the first two inputs can be swapped, and nothing changes. Because it doesn't matter whether you say x minus mu squared or whether you say mu minus x squared. Okay? That's a useful property sometimes. And now comes the more heavy stuff. Okay? So now let's rewrite our function yeah, as, a second, as an exponential of a second degree polynomial. Okay, so let's pass it. So it's an exponential, so it's the e function, e2 something. And this something is a second degree polynomial. Do you all know what polynomials are? Approximately, yeah. So basically it's some function x to the something plus 5 x to something minus 1 and so on and so forth. And it's a generalization of linear functions, right? A linear function is also polynomial of degree 1, okay? A constant function is a polynomial of degree 0, okay? And a parabola, yeah, a parabola is a second degree polynomial, okay? That's basically it. And that's what I just wrote down here. Now, what is written down here? So, where is it now a polynomial? It's a second degree polynomial in x, okay? So, there's an x squared with something in front of it, and there's an x with something in front of it, and then there's a constant term. And surprisingly, we can write our Gaussian function, we can write it also like this. And now before I show you that you can really do that, let me show you why I want this, why this is useful. Because to solve this question now, yeah, let's plug in the Gaussian distributions from above. And let's use the fact that both can be written as second degree, exponential of second degree polynomials. So if we know that this is possible, then this product of these two functions here gets really simple. Yeah? Because then we just need to add up the constant terms, and we add up the linear term, and we add up the square term. Because e to something times e to something else is e to something plus something else. Okay? And the sum of two polynomials, of two second degree polynomials, is again a second degree polynomial. Great. So, now here, we just need to read off the parameters of the resulting Gaussian distribution, and then we are done. Okay? So if you, you can also plug in the formula from the 10 mark shine in here, yeah? but then the whole calculation will be a complete mess, and it will be super complicated. So we do the work only in the lemma once and for all, and once we accept that it's an exponential of a second degree polynomial, we are done with the heavy weightlifting. And the rest is simple. Okay? 
However, the last step doesn't look so simple, but let's look at it in a second, okay? Okay, so now I'm, I hope you are super motivated to understand why this Gaussian distribution is the exponential of a second degree polynomial. So for this, um, we just need to cleverly assign these constants here. So the eta needs to be assigned to minus sigma to the minus blah and so on and so forth. And if you do this, then everything works out. Um, let me show you that it really works out. I show you on the board, okay? So let me get another one. Okay, so I think I need to bring my own shock. Okay, so how do we show this? We show it like that. So first let me write x of a, uh, and I will switch to the board in a second when I copy the formulas. This is an eta, yeah, some Greek letter. Okay, so far so good. Please tell me if I do any mistakes. Uh, I can also watch it, but my glasses are not very good. So this is still right, times mu. And the lambda square, what is it? Sigma to the minus squared. And then there's the a. minus a half uh, log 2 pi minus logarithm lambda squared plus lambda minus is that right? Please tell me, otherwise I'm messing the, the rest up. So now let's plug everything in, reshuffle, and then we have the Gaussian distribution. Okay? Um, okay, so e to the a, now we need to plug this in. So let's e to the a plus, so you know this one, e to whatever, e to what x plus y is the same as e to x times e to y, right? So this, these are now the kind of rules that we are using. So I'm plugging in the a. The a is also a summation of all of these terms here. So I will have an e to the um, minus a half logarithm to pi. Great. And then I have an e to the minus a half um, the minus minus gets the plus so I get a logarithm lambda squared and then I have an times e to the minus a half I, I, do, it's boring or it's do you want to see it Ah, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Very good. Excellent. Do you find it boring or do you want to see the calculation? You want to see it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, e to the minus. It's always nice if the professor messes up on the board. So let's see whether we have it today or another day. Okay, so far so good. So that was the a term. Then I have e to the eta x. So this is e to the, yeah, maybe I should keep those ones. Ah, I'm already messing up. I do my best. Sigma minus mu times x. Okay, great. And then I get another one with the lambda. e to the minus 1 half sigma minus x squared. Okay, that looks interesting. So this one here, sigma minus, that's like the divided by sigma thing. I also have it over here. Um, then I'm having here the x squared, and here I'm having mu times x. 
So there must be somewhere a mu squared, ideally, right? But I don't see it. Am I missing it? Eta. OK, so maybe I need to um, combine that one. OK, let's see how it goes. Um, so one half, can the minus one half e to the minus something, I think, is one divided by the minus makes it e one divided by e to the same thing with the positive sign that one half is like a square root, okay? So it's square root um, e to the log e to the log two pi. So I get the one divided by square root of two pi. That's good. That's good looking. Um, then I'm having the logarithm of L squared. Okay, I can drag out this thing to the front and it cancels, right? Is that right? I think I'm allowed to do that, isn't it? Isn't that equal to B times logarithm of A? I think it's right. Okay, very good. So let me get rid of that one. So that is equal to lambda. And the lambda is equal to sigma, 1 divided by sigma, so I get the sigma. Yeah? So I change the e to the log, disappears, and I have a lambda. Lambda square is sigma minus square, so the lambda is 1 divided by sigma. Okay? So far, so good. So this is already looking promising, right? So the rest must go, then the rest must explain the, the other stuff. Oh, here's an eta squared, so that's where I get my mu squared. Okay, so that's good. So let's plug it in. So I have a lambda um, squared, so this will be a sigma squared. So it was a, which one was it? Did I do a mistake now? Did I already mess up? I should put the video back. Ah, what did I had over here? So it was the last term. It was a lambda to the minus two, so lambda to the minus 2 is a sigma. OK, so where am I? Here. So it's a sigma squared. And the eta is the squared. However, this is a power to the 4 because it was an eta squared. Lucky me. OK, so here we have the x of something. So. What do we get? Um, we have a minus a half. Let's drag this one out. Times, canceling here, I will have the mu squared divided by sigma squared. OK, so that's looking good already. Then I'm having here the uh, sigma. Sigma, I have it everywhere. So let's drag it out, minus 2 sigma squared. That's looking even better mu squared. Here, I also have to drag out the minus a half. OK, so that gives me a minus 2 times mu times x. OK, and I'm dragging out these guys plus x squared. Whoa, lucky me. So this looks good, because now this is equal to x minus mu squared. Whew. I think I haven't done this for a while, but it looks OK. So why write it so complicated? Why this is, just, this is just a brain teaser here, right? The thing is, you go through the pain once, yeah, and then you can prove many theorems once you have this representation with the second order polynomial. Then you have a nice form, and then you can just nicely multiply to Gaussian distributions and get the coefficients, just read them off. These guys, they also have an, a meaning. Those are the so-called natural parameters of a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? The lambda one is easy to understand. It's the inverse variance. It's called precision. Yeah? So variance large, meaning very imprecise. Okay? Variance small, meaning um, very precise. Okay? So that kind of makes sense. And the other one is like a normalized mean. It's like the, the mean is, it's a mean where the scaling is taken out. Okay? Good, so far so good. 
So now you trust me that this is true. Surprisingly, we also need the other way around, right? We want to combine now two exponential of second degree polynomials, get a new exponential of second degree polynomials, and then we would say, so this is another Gaussian, okay? And this is indeed the case. So any second degree polynomial yeah, that you write like this, where c is greater than zero, so there must be a minus sign over here in front of the c. That's just the thing, you need a parabola which looks like this, yeah, and not a parabola which looks like that, okay? So if I define my eta to be b, and the lambda squared to be c, then I can adjust the a, so it's not, the, the writing is not ideal, so not any second order degree, but all of them where I can then adjust the a, yeah, gives rise to Gaussian distribution. So in particular, that means if I multiply two exponentials of second degree polynomials, I can read off eta and lambda square, okay? And then the rest will be normalized by the a, okay? So that's basically now what we can do with this. So let's apply it. Let's plug everything in. Here are now two exponentials, one and the other one, and multiplying e to the something, blah, blah, as I just said, it's just summing them up and adding two polynomials is really easy. You just sort the coefficients, right? So we sum up the coefficients of degree zero, we sum up the coefficients of degree one, and we sum up the coefficients of degree two, okay? Um, then we can just read off the parameters, and that's what you get from this, okay? So, um, Let's do this exemplarily. So let's see whether, whether I'm promised too much. So where do I get, so let's write down the lambda for this case, and let's write down the eta for that case, and then calculate the mu and the sigma squared, okay? So that you see that it's really working. So where do I have the eraser? Can you see the eraser anywhere? This big thing? I lost it. Ah. Thank you. Okay, so what is promised here is, let me just copy it. The eta is the b, and lambda squared is the c. Okay, great. Huh, do I really want to do this? <laughs> Where are my slides? Yeah. Do I really want to do this? Let's see, okay. Now, I think I don't do it. It gets too complicated here. But I worked it out for you on the next slide, luckily, okay? So here I worked it already out. I don't do it on the board now. It's getting a bit too messy. Um, so here everything is worked out. So what is B, what is C? Yeah, so this is coming from the first Gaussian distribution up here, yeah? And then there's a second Gaussian distribution, the E and the F, yeah, and it is, just the tau minus blah times y and so on, okay? And then we can calculate the posterior variance as c plus f inverse. This is just now following the formulas from the previous slide, so the definition of the natural parameters, okay? Um, the thing is, the trick here now is we don't have to worry about the normalization because in the bottom part there is no x. There is an x, right? But it's not really there because it's integrated out. So there's no free variable being an x. Okay, so there is no x in the bottom part. So this is just part of the normalization. And it somewhat gets merged with the a plus d. But it's a mess. But we know at the end that it will work because that's just how base rule is defined. It's properly normalized, okay? But we don't worry about it. You can do calculate it by hand so that it's really doing the right thing but we don't have to worry about it. If we have a calculation like that, all we care is what are the parameters of the resulting distribution, and to find out, we need to find out that it's a second degree polynomial under the exponential, then we know it's a Gaussian, 
And then we can read off the parameters, as I just said. And there are many terms that we don't have to worry about. Good. Um, here are a couple of more details. So the denominator does not depend on x. x is integrated out. And now there's nice interpretations for the posterior mean and for the posterior variance. Okay? So let's try to understand it, what is going on here. So my prior distribution had like some mu where I believe where it is, right? And I have a spread, a variance. That's my, the strength of my belief. If the sigma is very small, I'm super sure where the mu is. If the sigma is very large, I'm not so sure, OK? Um, next, given that I know the true value of x, I have a measurement y, OK? Also with a certain measurement error tau. Now, the thing is, my new knowledge about the x, of course, depends on the variance that I had before, but also on the variance of the measurement error. Okay? Let's say one of them is um, uh, very large. Okay? Let's say the measurement error of the, the measurement error tau was very large. That means that we'll have 1 divided by sigma minus blah plus 1 divided a very large number, which is like 0. Okay? So the resulting variance will be just the variance that I had before. So my initial belief had a certain variance. If my measurement error is super large, yeah, then my posterior will have exactly the variance of my, um, of my prior belief. Now suppose my measurement error is quite small. Then I can gain from the measurement something, and the variance will go down. Then the tau to the minus 2 yeah, will be a number which is larger than 0. Yeah? And so 1 divided by something larger than 0 will decrease. Okay, so the resulting variance will be smaller than the one from my prior. That's what we were also seeing when we looked at the glasses example. Okay, there we were also seeing that the variance was getting smaller and smaller. So that's the story for the variance. It's just a complicated way of writing things, like this 1 divided by sigma to the minus thing that's like double 1 divided 1. The formula for the precision is much nicer. So here you have a certain precision, and here you have a certain precision. And the posterior precision will be just the sum of the two. Yeah, so that would be a nice exercise. I'm not sure whether we have it as an exercise. So that would be a nice exercise. Let's look at the other stuff. So what about the mean now? So the mean is the weighted average of the mu that we have already. Yeah? Let's ignore the bottom part for a second. Okay? So let's just look at the top part. So the top part says the resulting one, the resulting mean of x is the old mean plus my observation. And the weighting depends on my measurement error. So if my measurement error is very, 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 very small, I put a very large weight in front of the y, because tau to the minus 2 will be a very large number. Similarly, if my variance was very small already for my prior, I was super sure about it, then the mu gets a very large weight. Okay? So this mean here is really a weighted average of two numbers. Okay? However, sigma and tau don't sum up to 1. These weights are not normalized, so I need to normalize. And that's what the bottom part is doing. So the bottom part is ensuring that the weight in front of the mu and the weight in front of the y sum up to 1. Okay? That's basically what it is. So it has a very nice interpretation. You have a Gaussian distribution, you have a certain location and a certain variance, and you have a measurement of it yeah, with a certain measurement error, then the posterior distribution gives you an update of the mean, which is the weighted average of what you knew before and of your measurement. And the weights depend on the variances that you use over here. Okay? So it has a really nice interpretation. Great. So far, so good. We could also have several observations. Yeah? So instead of having only one observation, I can have several observations. And now your yesterday's posterior is today's prior. Okay? And tomorrow's prior is today's posterior. I hope I said that right. Okay? But you, you get the idea. So I can also use this one now, after having one observation as a starting point, as my new prior for x, and have another observation and combine it again. And you guess it, it will also be a Gaussian distribution. And of course, you can also write it out. So basically, 
we are multiplying lots of these likelihoods, which are now new observations, yeah, new measurements of the height of someone or something. And combining all of those gives me another nice Gaussian distribution. Let's look at the formula again. So it's now a weighted average of mu and the summation of my measurements. Or you could also say it's a weighted average of what I knew before with a certain weight and what I gained from my measurements. Okay? And again, the, no the bottom part is just a normalization so that the weights are properly normalized and the variance also works the same. Only it's now not sigma plus tau, but it's now sigma plus tau plus tau plus tau plus tau plus tau. And always the, the wrong one, the inverse. Okay, so it's the same thing. So far, so good. Next topic. Let's do the same thing, but now for the multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the reason why I did it in so much detail over here and worked it all out and wrote it on the slide is so that I can do the same stuff for the multivariate distribution. Now, what is the multivariate distribution? Let's look at it first. So, basically now, here the x and the mu are n vectors, so they are n-dimensional vectors. So, like from the r to the n, like from the r to the 3 or something, okay? And the sigma now, the variance, is a matrix. It's an n by n matrix, and it's called the so-called covariance matrix. And it must have certain properties. It must be symmetric and positive definite. Those are just properties that it needs to have. Okay. Um, again, you can show, you can prove with some mass that the expectation, so the integral of this density times vector x is equal to mu. This can be shown. And you can also show that the covariance matrix, so this is the covariance matrix, the, the true one, yeah, if you do the integration, you will end up with a sigma. But of course, the mass gets more involved. But it's doable. Yeah? Then we have these bars around the sigma, and that's the notation for the determinant. Okay? If you don't know again what the determinant was, the determinant was a single real number, which is kind of summarizing a matrix. Okay? And in a way, the determinant is telling you what's happening to volumes. Okay? So if you have like a volume in your vector space and you map this volume with your linear transformation, what is the resulting volume? Okay, so that is what the determinant is telling you. If you only know how to cal do calculations with it, that's already something. Yeah, that's already fine. Next the thing is, so what does it mean that a matrix is positive definite? That was the thing that eigenvalues are all positive. So that might and yet another jargon thing. We will talk a lot about eigenvectors and eigenvalues in the PCA lectures. Okay? They I will repeat all of the stuff with eigenvectors and eigenvalues and throw in my own notation. Here it just is, I wrote it only down because um, before we were talking about the variance and the variance should be something positive. Yeah? So some positive number. Here now the positive definiteness is like a generalization of positiveness for scalars generalized to matrices. Like for a matrix, how do you define whether it's positive or negative? You do it by saying all eigenvalues are positive. Okay, so that's how you translate it into the world of um, matrices. Curiously, a scalar is a one by one matrix, and if you have a scalar, let's say the scalar five, the eigenvalue of this one by one matrix is five. Okay? And so being positive like nicely translates also to so the eigenvalues being positive translates nicely to the special case of scalars as well. What else? So the univariate case that we've seen before is also a special case of the multivariate one, yeah, where we where our vector is only one dimensional and our matrix is just a single <coughs> entry. So far so good. This, by the way, is sometimes called the Mahalanobis distance. Yeah, this thing is now not so simple as x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared, but this depends on the ordering. So you cannot just swap these things around. Yeah, so you have a vector times a matrix times a vector here. Yeah, and this thing is called the Mahalanobis distance. So it's like an, a distance which is not iso isotropic, so not the same in all directions, but like they are, the iso lines are now ellipti ellipticity, uh, ellipticity. What are they called? Elliptical. They're elliptical. Okay? I don't know what the noun is. Um, and by the way, the eigenvectors of the matrix sigma are the, 
the main radii, radii of this ellipsis, okay? But those are just some technical details. Anyway, I hope you are already properly scared, yeah? Because now comes the same theorem as before with an exponential of a second degree polynomial, but now with vectors. Before we do that, let's again look at these terms, whether they make sense or not. So first, the scalar. Okay, 2 pi, 2 something, it's a scalar, fine. Right, the whole thing must be a scalar. Determinant of a matrix is a scalar, fine. What about the back part here? There are all these vectors and matrices. So let's write this down once on the board. And um, let's see. So basically, it's something like this. And I don't know whether I did it already in these video lectures. I like now to visualize these vectors because they tell you something about the shapes. So let's first do the visualization for two matrices, OK? So let's, this is a matrix, matrix multiplication. And let's say this is a 5 by 10 and 11 by 12 matrix. So does this run on your computer? Is it valid? Or does it run on your piece, pencil and paper calculations? No? Why not? Yes. Yeah. The inner dimensions must agree. Yeah. Why is that the case? Because if you look at the, if you calculate it, let's say I want to have the ij's entry of this resulting thing, what I need to do is I need to sum over another variable, aik, bk, J. So the k is running over the second index of A, which is the number of columns, and over the first index of B, which is the number of rows. So this is kind of a mismatch. Okay, so they must be the same. And then everything is fine. So the inner dimensions must agree. I could also multiply with a vector here, right? Just make sure that it is has 12 entries. And then a vector will have one column. So in my head, there are only matrices. There are no vectors. So vectors are just column vectors, typically. But there are also row vectors. This is a row vector. So I could also multiply from the other side another vector. And now this is, needs to be transposed. And then the dimensionality of this guy will be 1 by 5. So if I write a capital letter, typically it's a matrix, yeah, a real matrix with yeah, non-one dimensions. If I write a small Latin letter, it's typically a column vector. And I can also write it as a row vector by writing W transposed. Let's look back at this picture here. So this will be something like n times 1. And the sigma is a symmetric matrix, so it's a squared matrix. It's an n by n matrix. And so this is then a 1 by n. Now, the curious thing here is, if I do this calculation, A times B, what is the resulting shape of A and B? So what is the resulting shape if those are the sizes? One by one. No, uh, I omitted this one now. So they are not there. Five by 12, Five by 12 exactly. Yeah, so the, outer so the inner dimension gets summed up. It disappears. It's marginalized out in a way. Yeah? And the outer dimensions become the outer dimension. And you're right. The dimension, this one gets summed out. This one gets summed out. So the whole thing here will be a scalar. Yeah? So let's write it like this, r to the 1. So if I look at that one, the resulting thing will be also a scalar. Another way to draw now pictures would be, I, I could draw a picture like this is a rectangular thing like this, like 12 by 10. And then this thing must approximately have the same size by 5. And this is a 5 vector by 1. And then I have a 12 vector by 1. So I can also make this little comic down here to check the sizes, whether everything is right. Python is sometimes not nice to you and does some broadcasting or some other fancy stuff. And it doesn't give you always proper type errors. So in Python, you can multiply A with some other shapes. And sometimes it works and you don't see it. 
In other languages, they're more strict. Anyway, so the picture for that one is, here's an x, this is a matrix, and this is the thing transposed, and the thing transposed is this one. So the result will be a dot, OK? I do these things all the time. Otherwise, you get confused, right? It gets really difficult if you don't have the, the shapes right. OK, it's quarter two. Let's go on a little bit. I hope you don't mind, OK? OK, great. So we figured out that this thing up here is a scalar, yeah? e to the minus some scalar, which is fine. It's also OK to leave, so I don't mind if you do leave now, if you are in a hurry. But let me go through at least the multivariate stuff, OK? <coughs> Again, this is a function that is always greater or equal to, to 0 for the same reason. It also integrates to 1. OK, this is already danger zone, right? So this is now dx, where x is a vector. It's a high dimensional integral. Not so much fun, maybe. It's also symmetric in x and mu. Same thing, same trick. Um, and it's also an exponential of a second degree polynomial. That's more exciting, right? So what is a polynomial with a vector? So let's look at it. We have a scalar for the constant term, for the degree 0. And then we have a vector, a row vector times a column vector for the linear term. Okay? And then we have a quadratic form for the second order term. So this is, again, a row vector times matrix times a column vector giving us a scalar, OK? So these three things are all scalars. And now the rest is just carefully writing up everything in the same way as we did before. So we can define an eta, but eta now must be a column vector. And it is a column vector of multiplying sigma to the minus 1. It was sigma minus squared times the mean, but now it's the matrix times the vector resulting in a vector, which is good. And then there's also this letter A, which is now the normalizing constant. And also those now must be all scalars. Luckily, this is the determinant. So this is, is a scalar. And this is, again, a row vector times matrix times column vector. It's also a scalar, OK? So everything is fine. And everything is just copied. So if you plug in the 1D case, you will get exactly the same stuff as before. This is the same sentence as before just replaced the letters. OK, this is exactly the same calculation as before. Everything stays the same. We again have an exponential of a second degree polynomial, yeah? but now with vectors and matrices. But again, we can use the same tricks. However, these new parameters here now are matrices. That's why I use here some capital letters. And then again, you can read off the correct parameters. The terms even look the same, right? I still having a weighted average of the mu and the y. However, now they get scaled with the inverse covariance matrix. So basically, there could be some dimensions which have a small measurement error. Some other dimensions have a larger measurement error. And this can be all expressed in these matrices, OK? That's why I have these more complicated things. And then this thing in the front must be multiplied from the left, yeah? And then everything is properly normalized, and the weights are properly normalized. And the rest is the same. So here are also everything written out, same calculations as before. And this is just copy and paste from the previous pages. As a side note, um, this thing is also, let's say you have a function f which has a vector input, and you do a Taylor expansion of that one, OK? Taylor expansion meaning you calculate the first derivative and the second derivative, for example, and maybe the third and the fourth, but let's say only the first and the second. If my function f is a vector input function, so if I have f of x, where x is now r to the n, then the first derivative is the gradient of f, right? And that's typically a vector that can be multiplied, of course, with x. And the second derivative is the Hessian matrix, OK? And the Hessian matrix can be multiplied from both sides with a vector. 
So this is now in some constant term. So this is now just sketchy written out. This is like a Taylor expansion of second degree, but for vectors. Okay. Now you wonder maybe, so what's happening now? What's going on? So the next term will be a tensor. And what is a tensor? A tensor is just generalizing the idea of vector, matrix, and a tensor is a cube. And then the next tensor will be a four-dimensional cube. And now the multiplication can be nicely written from left and right by a matrix. And with a cube, you have three sides where you have to put a vector. Okay? You have to sum out three sides. And the next one, and so on and so forth. But it's just how you would expect it to be. Okay? So it looks a bit scary, but it really isn't. Okay, curiously, that's another insight. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, yeah, the e to the, this function is exactly a second degree polynomial. Of course, we can have higher degree polynomials that would give us some non Gaussian distributions, which are more complicated. And they have so called higher order moments. We don't worry about that yet. Okay, so far so good. So we've shown something. So let's see. We've shown the lemma, and we've shown that the posterior is as well a Gaussian distribution with the same interpretation, just the notation got more weird. Okay, that's it. But this, the ideas are exactly the same. Okay, now let's see what's coming next. So the rest of the lectures are now just simple things that can be all proven with the same trick, but we don't prove it anymore. Now, do you have to memorize all these formulas now? No, you don't. You only need to memorize what's written on the last slide. Yeah? So let's go through it. So if you have a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood, then the, Gaussian, the joint distribution will be also Gaussian. That's something new that we didn't know before. So if you multiply these two Gaussian distributions, you will end up with this Gaussian distribution. How can you prove it? Using the same tricks as before and reading off the parameters. But we don't do this. Of course, now this sounds like a nice exercise that one could do. I don't know whether we have it. So it, it's not really difficult. It's only tedious. And you be, have to be precise. Now, what about x being multivariate? That is no problem. Suppose x is five-dimensional and y is five-dimensional, then this notation just means that you stack two five-dimensional vectors on top of each other. So the y could be also ten-dimensional. You could stack them on top. It's just the v stack in Python, stacking two vectors on top of each other. Similarly, this one, if I have four matrices, I can make a cat. Is it cat or stack? You can stack them next to each other and have one big matrix where all the submatrices are given. Yeah, so this is just the notation how you would do it in programming. Okay? When you integrate out the x, you also end up with a Gaussian distribution. And this slide now you don't have to memorize, but it's more like a formula, a collection of formulas where you can go back. When you are in this situation, you can read off the formula from this slide. Here's another one. So if you have the product rule, yeah, you can read it for Gaussians like this, y given x kind of, and x, and you can rewrite it as x, and this, the, the, the mu now contains the y in here, so that is the x given y times p of y. Okay? So this is a product rule written out for Gaussian distributions. So basically, if you have an expression that looks like that, you can rewrite it with, whoops, with two other Gaussian distributions, with other parameters. And that's something that you sometimes need. And there are different variants of this that I put down here for completeness. Again, this is a collection of formula. The proof is always via the exponential of a second degree polynomial. Next one, Gaussian marginals and conditionals. You, get, you can guess the answer already, right? If you start with a Gaussian and you do like marginalization or conditioning, you stay inside the set of Gaussian distributions. So, and this is the worked out example. So x and y might be vectors, and then mu and nu are also vectors of the same size, and the a, b, and c are matrices. So here's the b transpose because it's a symmetric matrix. Okay. And then basically reading off the top left part here gives you the covariance matrix of the marginalized Gaussian. So everything's super nice. 
Yeah? Everything works out very well. The one for the conditional looks a bit more complicated. Yeah? But again, the operations are just linear algebra. There's nothing complicated happening here. What else do we have? Some rule. OK, suppose you have um, the joint distribution being this Gaussian distribution from before, and now integrating out x, what do you get for p of y? And surprisingly, you get exactly the same thing. Did I have it already on the? Yeah, it's the same thing as this one, but now spelled out, written as a sum rule for Gaussians. Okay, but it's the same thing as marginalization from before. What else do I have now? Maybe something slightly more exciting. Suppose I have a Gaussian distribution where x is again a vector, and I have a linear transformation of that one. Yeah, and guess what? A linear transformation of a Gaussian distribution is again a Gaussian distribution. You have to linearly transform the mean, and you kind of more complicated transform the variances. You need to multiply them from the left and from the right. Okay. And this can be used to prove that the sum of two Gaussian distribution is also a Gaussian. Yeah. So with the sum, I now mean that you define a new random variables where you sum up the Gaussian distributions. You are not summing up densities, but you are summing up random variables. Okay, I, I see that you get tired. So here's more notation, and this is the, the finish. So just a second. Yeah. We will be released soon. So for the whole lecture, we wrote it like this, n, x, comma, mu, comma, sigma, because we were more thinking about it like I implemented as a function in a computer. However, it's very often we will write it like x given mu and sigma. And this is now stressing the fact that this is a density in terms of x, and mu and sigma are basically other random variables on which I condition my distribution. Okay? And then we can write down things like Bayes' rule. We can, for example, say, what is p of mu given x, and things like that. Okay? So it's often useful to say the mu and the sigma, the parameters are random variables themselves, okay? And that's why I put the bar in here. And so the bar separates the variables that could be summed over to get one yeah, from the other ones where I cannot sum over. OK, here's the summary. So this is the summary. You just need to memorize. If you multiply two PDFs, two Gaussian PDFs, you get a Gaussian PDF. OK? If you marginalize out, oh, my battery is going down. If you marginalize out a Gaussian, you get a Gaussian. If you condition, with the Gaussian PDFs, you get Gaussians. And in general, affine linear mappings of Gaussians are also Gaussians. However, if you multiply two Gaussian random variables like x times y, you get a new random variable which is not Gaussian. So you must distinguish between multiplying the PDFs and multiplying the random variables. That's an important distinction. So, and there's a deep insight from Philip Hennig, who's a former colleague of mine from University of Tübingen. Gaussians are from probability theory what affine linear mappings are for algebra. And that is a very deep, profound statement. Yeah? So basically, linear mappings can be combined and are linear, and so on and so forth. You can, whatever, reduce the dimensions. You can do projections and all of these things, and you stay linear. Yeah? And the same applies to Gaussian distributions. They also combine like that. And, um, there are more, more parallels, so also Gaussian distributions are represented by a matrix and a vector. Linear operations are represented by a matrix and a vector, linear affine, affine meaning like shifting something. And both can be used to approximate complicated stuff, like we can use so-called Laplace approximation, which is like a Gaussian approximation to any distribution, and that's the same as doing a linear approximation. Um, however, there's more details. So far, so good. Sorry for going over time. Next time, I will try to finish at a quarter past. Any questions? Yes? So we should memorize the formula for the Gaussian distribution? Yes, that would be nice. As well as the multivariate distribution? Yeah, please memorize the multivariate Gaussian distribution as well. But then if there's a question in your exam and you can't solve it, ask us, OK? That's no problem. No. You only need it. So the thing is, I could make the lecture and just show you this slide, and that's the whole lecture. But I want to prove it, and I want to show you why it's the case. 
And it's a case because they have this nice form. Okay. There was another question? No? Another question? Okay. Then thanks for your extended attention, and I see you on Wednesday.